Hello, and welcome to another historically inspired capsule wardrobe. This is the series where I take a historical time period and attempt to modernize the styles, and show you examples of how 12 different pieces could be effectively planned and worn together. Medieval has, so far, been the top requested time period, but I was hesitant to do it for two reasons. One, medieval is not a time period which I have much expertise on. Though I can't place the era or nationality of a particular trend, I do know what a lot of the different historical styles were. So this video will not be pinpointed to a particular century and will just be general medieval. The other reason I was hesitant to tackle medieval is because I didn't think there would be enough versatility to make a capsule wardrobe interesting, with everything being strictly dress format rather than skirts and bodices. I found the solution to this problem over in the Regency decades, where short poofy sleeve dresses often had matching longer sleeves that could be stitched on temporarily for the winter months. The most interesting part of medieval dresses were often their sleeves, the way they would drape and layer and display the most beautifully contrasting colors. So what if sleeves could be sewn with a short upper and a detached lower, which could be done in a variety of ways, from hook and eyes, to buttons, to laces. But then, I think there would be enough versatility to make it fun. So, let's get started. For the silhouette, my base pattern for the dresses will be a T-length princess seamed dress. You could interchange this with a simpler gourd dress, or a more complex dress with even more panels. But for simplicity, I'll illustrate the dresses with this base. All of the necklines will be wide, the waist will be fairly fitted, and the upper sleeves will be mid-bicep length. For my color palette, I'm sticking to this selection of eight, a darker and a lighter shade of each Hogwarts house. The first piece I'm going to recommend for this capsule is a linen shift, because if you're going to make yourself fine dresses of wool, silk, or velvet, you'll probably want to keep them clean. Unless you spend a lot of time with small children, probably 90% of the grime you wash off your clothes is coming from your own sweat and dead skin. So make a shift. This shift would be off-white, and the sleeves, neckline, and hem would be just a couple of inches shorter than the dress base, so that they do not show from the outside. The second piece will be the red dress from the St. George painting. Come on, I had to do it, and you know you wanted to see it. It would be made of a fine, lightweight, ruby red wool. It will get a center opening and a bit of a lower neckline, so that the shift can be visible above it. The front will close with metal hooks, and the sleeves... Okay, this is interesting. You know how fashions often evolve from each other, and many trends are impractical exaggerations of a once logical style. It occurs to me that the overlong draping sleeves you see so often might have once been simple laced sleeves, just unlaced to let the arms free. Maybe people liked the look of it, and they started making sleeves over the sleeves just for this purpose, and the oversleeve started getting longer and longer, and... You get the idea. So, bringing it back to modernizing. You could probably get away with drapey sleeves, but not ones that drag on the floor. So if we reverse this hypothetical trend, you get average length sleeves that can be laced closed or unlaced and left to drape. Combine that with multiple detachable sleeves, and suddenly you get a crazy number of combinations that can be made from just a few sleeves. So the sleeves of the red dress will follow suit. They will be the same red wool, but lined in a lighter shade of silk. They will lace all the way down and be fitted, but if the lacing cords are removed, they will drape freely, and the lining will be visible. The dress will also get some kind of gold trim along the neckline, and the sleeve edges, to disguise the joint in the sleeves. Actually, that trim is really pretty, and I want the shift to have some too. The third piece will be a simple dress, in gold, because I think that will be the most versatile color. At first I made it slightly longer, so that the two different hems would stand out, but I later evened it out with the other dresses. I'm still not sure about that decision because it didn't look quite right on paper, but I feel like it was a good idea and it would look better in real life. Or you could accomplish a similar effect by pulling up slightly on the overskirt and tucking it into a belt to display the underskirt. You often see that, though I didn't feel like drawing it. This golden dress will not get detachable sleeves because it is meant to be a base layer and an underdress. It will also be made from silk so that it is soft against the skin. The sleeves will be closely fitted and overlong, so that they bunch up slightly around the wrist. And see, we already have another combination for the red dress. For the fourth piece, an olive green silk dress, because I want olive green sleeves to pair with the St. George dress. Not going to lie, I floundered a lot with this one. I ended up going fairly simple. The sleeves are close fitting, and the wrist buttons up with small gold buttons. There is some subtle gold trimming around the neckline and the oversleeves, but that's it. Now that we have a base to work with, I think I want to switch gears and do some accessories. For the fifth piece, I'm going to start with a belt. One of the three chief medieval belts I see used. That is the leather belt, the braided belt, and the medallion belt. And I think gold medallions will go best with the metallic palette I'm using. 
I basically just traced it off of a Pinterest pic. I like the idea of a little bit of excess dangling in the front, but not too much. And I would also go with an adjustable belt, so that it could be worn high on the waist, mid-rise, or low on the waist. For the sixth piece, some kind of bag. I know one of the central cornerstones of history bounding is adding pockets to everything, and you could certainly do that here. But I also like the idea of having an excuse to use the actual historical item, and in this case, an embroidered little belt bag versus an invisible pocket? I'll go with the bag. It would be brown velvet, embroidered in colors from the rest of the palette, with dangling tassels and a cord to tie around the medallion belt. For the seventh piece, I think she needs shoes. Let's go with simple little flats, with pointed toes. They could be covered in the same olive green silk as the dress, and maybe a pattern could be embroidered over them. Next, for the eighth piece, I think I do want to add a burgundian dress. I wasn't planning on it, but don't those fur-trimmed dresses just look so warm for the winter? Let's make it out of a lighter shade of blue with brown fur trimmings. It does look a bit plain, so how about this one being made from some kind of damask? Since this one is a winter dress by default, it could be a heavy woven wool or a silk velvet. The high waistband could be made part of the dress, or since it is just a simple strip, it could be made separate and probably hook and eyed in the back. Then it could be worn with other pieces, changing them up a tiny bit. By the way, I feel like I should mention when I talk about silk and wool and velvet, I'm talking about hypotheticals and ideals. I know those fabrics are incredibly expensive, even if you can find them. And an actual full wardrobe exactly like I'm describing would be an outrageously expensive venture. But you know, imagine the best and compromise where you have to. For the ninth piece, how about a dress from Hunter Greenwool? I'd like to try some dagging. You see a lot of women's sleeves being long and dagged. I swear I've seen hems being dagged as well and then layered over contrasting underdresses, but when I went looking for a reference, all I could find was this Victorian history bounding cosplayer, and I'm not sure I want to take her word for it. But I do like it, so let's do it anyways. Since this dress by nature will be an overdress, it needs to be more versatile, so I think I'll keep the decoration minimal and just use a row of gold buttons up the front. Also, I forgot to say, if I don't mention a front closure, just insert a zipper or lacing section, whatever you prefer, into either the back or the side seam. And it might be worth doing some lacing up the backs of all of the dresses anyways, just to get a more exact fit. And for the final dress, the tenth piece, I want to base it off of this one. Probably make it from a heavy silk or even a silk wool blend. The fleur de lis pattern could be painted or embroidered. This dress will also get a gold trim around the neckline and the sleeve hems. For the sleeves, how about we get in one good drapey pair? Because we must pay homage to the queen of taking medieval fashion and doing what she wants with it. This dress is all out, not even trying to be subtle medieval. How about making the drapey sleeves in a slightly darker blue velvet, lined with a lighter blue silk? For the 11th piece, we are doing a pretty good job with warmth, but let's add a cloak. It could be made from that burgundy shade, a single layer of heavy wool, some trim around the edges, a large gold clasp at the neck, Simple but effective. And for the twelfth piece, a hood. Also wool based off of this pick. Long leafy dagged edges with embroidery. I thought I'd do it out of a golden brown wool, but I don't know if I like that, so I changed it to brown. I might change up the shape of the hood slightly, lose the long tail. I don't know, I guess it's up to a person's personal history bounding tolerance. And then I decided that I didn't like the dagged sleeves on the green dress. I don't know if that's because I didn't draw them well enough, or if they're just too much to modernize, but I think I'm going to switch them out with another set of sleeves, like the ruby red dress, so that they can button all the way up, or be worn open and draped. And the lining could be another remnant of that olive green silk. Alright, I've been playing around with the pieces for a while, and I don't think I like it. It feels unwieldy somehow. It doesn't feel like an effective capsule wardrobe. There are too many pieces that don't combine well enough. And also, the colors are kind of bothering me. I think they would be more effective if I pared them down to a smaller palette. I know medieval dress did usually involve lots of bright clashing colors, but this is history mounting, and we need to find the line where they are beautiful for modern wear, too. The reds and yellows go well with everything, but the greens and blues do not match each other super well. I think if I had broken the palette down to one or the other, it would have been more versatile. I like the green palette because it looks very woodsy all leaves and trees and pops of red berries. But the blue palette strikes me as very regal, the way the bold blues contrast with the ruby reds and the golden yellows. I put it up to a vote on Instagram, which, by the way, you should follow me, because I need more voters. I got a pretty even split of votes, and too many people said they liked both to make a decision. 
However, either palette felt just a little bit too limiting, and I knew I would be throwing away a lot of beautiful combinations. So I decided I should look again and try and figure out how to make both colors work. I think the hole in the collection is that there needs to be one more dress for layering, a light blue dress. But that means I need to get rid of one thing. And sadly, I think it'll be the brown hood. I'll save it, maybe it will fit in better with another collection later. But for now, it's just not versatile enough. Instead, I will lift the hood and add it to the cloak. Other than that, I'm going to work with the colors of the accessories some more. See if I can pair them down to the reds and the yellows. I'm also going to change up the color schemes of the three overdresses, making the fleur de lis dress green and giving the dagged dress a pattern and trimmings, so that the blue and green each have one patterned dress. But now the dagged dress has a bit too much in comparison to the fleur de lis dress, so I think I'll switch and give it the button placket. And, since the Burgundian dress is the least versatile, I'll change the damask to gold and brown. Ah, balance at last. You know what? I think I'm happy with it. This leaves three lightweight silk dresses, primarily meant for underlayering or summer wear, three heavy wool or velvet dresses, primarily meant for overlayering or winter wear, and the ruby red dress of lightweight wool, which is a surprisingly versatile color here, and can work as either an overdress or an underdress. Only the yellow dress and the burgundian dress have attached sleeves. The other five dresses each have one set of detachable sleeves, which can be freely layered and mismatched. For so many combinations, I really didn't feel like trying to do that math. Okay, here they are, all 12 pieces. Let's check out some of the combinations we can make. So they can trade sleeves with each other pretty liberally. Some of the combinations work better than others. The darker ones of the same color tone tend to look really nice. Then the laced sleeves could be unlaced and allowed to drape, and even layered on top of each other. Or they could have no oversleeves and just be nice summer dresses. They all look pretty decent with the light green. I guess the blue one's not too bad, it just looks a little bit Easter-y to me. But I guess that's not a bad thing, maybe that's just a personal thing. Same thing with the blue sleeves, they all look fine except the light green and light blue to me looks Easter-y. I think they all look nice with the red. And then the red could be opened, and the blue and green sleeves could be layered underneath. I think they all look good with the dark green. Again, the blue and the green, but you know, it's not even that bad, I'm just nitpicky. And then with the dark blue, I think that one's, that one's pretty good. Let's pair them all with the Fleur de Lis dress. Doesn't really do much on the red. But you also have to keep in mind that in real life, when you're dealing with real fabrics and textures, there's a lot more color variation than when you're just dealing with flat colors on a screen. That one looks really nice. I like that with all of the different colors. And the burgundy dress. Looks pretty good, but again, it's like a complete outfit unto itself. It doesn't really give you much options for mitch matching. Let's try them all with the red dress. It's okay. For some reason in this collection, I tend to prefer the red either by itself or as a pop of color. I don't think it's as good as the predominant color. Let's try the belt and the purse. It's pretty nice. Oh, oh, and let's try the cloak. I really do like burgundy for the cloak. It's really nice. Hoods up. Open some sleeves back up. Let's try layering some of the sleeves. And a final look to go out on. Ah, so pretty. I think for this time period, 12 pieces might have been a little much, unless you just really, really want to dress medieval 24-7. However, the great thing about it is that with the detachable sleeves, you can make a great number of combinations out of a small number of dresses. You could eliminate two dresses in either green or blue, and bring the capsule down to 10, and the dresses down to 5. Or you could focus on one color, making a neutral underdress, a lighter colored lightweight silk dress, and a heavy wool overdress, and however many sets of sleeves you want. You could even make a highly effective microcapsule. Say you just made two dresses, with four sets of sleeves. That would be a relatively simple project, and you could still get a lot of versatility out of it. But, as I've said before, the purpose of these design sessions is not to give you an exact roadmap to follow, but rather to explore ideas. I encourage you to pick through the ideas you like, and to discard the ones you don't like, and to add to it with your own ideas and inspirations. So, I hope you enjoyed. And though I don't know how soon it'll be up on my docket, which capsule wardrobe would you prefer to see next? Viking or Outlander? 